Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Rowe, and I am the CEO of the Campaign for Wool in Canada and its parent organization, the Canadian Wool Council. Thank you all so much for joining the latest in our Spinning Yarn speaker series. Um, this speaker series was created uh, at the request of you, our, our stakeholders, uh, to keep you more in the loop on the work of the Wool Council uh, on our different projects, as well as introducing you to speakers across the Canadian value chain and from around the world, uh, who are all share the common thread of a passion for wool. Um, today, we've got, uh, again, the, well, before, before we dive into today's project, I just wanted to, I guess, report back slightly. We've had a, we've had a busy couple of months um, just very recently, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that Ellen is on the call as well. Uh, I won't put you completely on the spot, but maybe if people have questions, uh, we'll, we'll put it over to you. Um, we, uh, there was a, 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 we had a small del Canadian delegation at the recent International Wool Textile Organization conference in Kyoto, Japan. Um, this was the very the first congress that we'd ever attended in person. Uh, Jane and I had attended the very first roundtable. There's two meetings a year. One is the roundtable. One is the congress. Um, uh, again, just as a as a selling point for any any of you, and obviously if you're on this call, you have a passion for wool and fiber. Um, attending a, an IWTO conference is is next level uh, in terms of being able to keep up to date on what is the latest in terms of technology, in terms of applications. But obviously, as with all conferences, the true value lies in meeting um, just the sheer number of people uh, involved in this industry from around the world. And at the Congress, you know, when Jane and I were in in Germany in December, you know, that was an excitement on its own because that was the first in-person meeting we'd ever attended. And that was about 80 people and in, still including a lot of the big players. Um, but at, in Kyoto, there was 300. So again, it's sort of orders of magnitude larger and you really just get a, a massive cross-section of people representing domestic sheep and wool industries, producer organizations, manufacturers, scours, spinners, weavers, brokers, traders. Um, I've never met so many Australians in my life, uh, including a trip to Australia. Uh, so it was a it was it was a really great experience. And part of that group um, we was was myself, uh, Carol Siebert, uh, who chairs the international the, the interiors group of which uh, Jane and I are also members, um, and Ellen uh, on this call, who came along to join the Young Professional series. And maybe if you have some questions about that, um, Ellen will be kind to to chime in at the end. But I'm I'm not putting you on the spot, Ellen. Um, but uh, but but it it was a great opportunity to be able to be connected with professionals from around. The the world who are working in wool and also again gave a sense of the different orders of magnitude of our different industries because you know Ellen was talking about her operation and then uh, right beside her was a young lady from Tasmania who was taking over the family farm with a 9,000 head of merino sheep so again it really <laughs> it shows that again um uh, it really is just a, a, a very diverse industry and being able to also understand where different countries, different people are are coming from, also where the opportunities lie. So um, if you do have, we all members and participants in, uh, in Canadian Wool Council activities are able to attend these conferences at the member rate. So again, uh, please look for uh, future activities, including we are excited to announce uh, the the next roundtable, which is looking to be in Montreal this December. So please stay tuned for more information on that to be able to attend a meeting a little bit closer to home. Um, but in terms of of exciting developments in in our neck of the woods, um, we have today's presentation. We have Jane, uh, a familiar face to many of you on these calls, uh, and a a regular contributor to the work of the Wool Council and the Campaign for Wool here in Canada. Uh, Jane helped to write the uh, strategic plan uh, that guides all of our work, our wool plan, uh, as well as the the carpet plan uh, from last year. And this is the latest in a series uh, of looking at value added applications for Canadian wool. Uh, and we're looking at a and I know uh, Jane's always very um, 
concerned when I start rambling on that I'm going to take all of her introductory notes. So I yeah. won't say too much about the upholstery plan. I'm going I'll let her dive into it. But again, this this all comes out of uh, a government funded effort to look at what are the high value added applications for Canadian wool specifically and and not where we could go or mm -hmm. or what could be done, but based on the clip as it looks right now. So we're really excited to have Jane tell us a little bit about the upholstery plan and and this exciting new application for Canadian wool. So over to you, Jane. Thank you, Matthew. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Matthew said, today, we're going to talk a little bit about upholstery. And if you were on the, the, the call early, you might have heard me say that um, when we had done the carpet plan, what was interesting about that is we had already done a carpet prototype. So we had a good understanding of what we could produce, what we wanted to produce, what worked, what didn't. That helped us narrow down the manufacturing chain. Um, with the upholstery plan, uh, we, hadn't, we haven't done a prototype yet. Um, I believe that there is one in the works and Matthew will talk about that at the, at the end. But it created certain challenges, but also certain opportunities because we didn't have uh, an actual end product in mind. Like we didn't have the specs in mind. So um, I decided that with this presentation, I'm going to go in and, and I pulled out some of the things that we learned doing this upholstery, doing this plan um, that were unique um, things that we hadn't realized before, things that emerged from the research that might make for a more interesting story. So, you know, even, even though we're looking at, you know, bigger commercialization projects with Canadian wool, we always like the story. That's always, we come back to that, um, the story of Canadian wool, the story of Canadian farmers, um, the story of Canada itself, our climate, the way we are as people, that's part of the value of a, a a wool brand or a wool product from Canada. So Alyssa, will we put the presentation up? And those of you who know me as well know that I don't like PowerPoint at all. <laughs> I find it distracts from, from what, uh, what we try and convey in these things. But um, Alyssa does such lovely jobs with our PowerPoints that, um, We'll go in and maybe the second slide, please. There we go. As always, uh, there'll be a question and answer period at the end, and you can ask your questions in French or English, and I'm happy to answer in both languages. Um, Matthew, would you mind giving acknowledgements for this plan to our sponsors so that we don't forget them? Or you're on mute. There it is. <laughs> I'd be delighted. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thanks, as always, uh, to, to all of our financial supporters. Um, but in particular for this plan, uh, the the government of Canada, uh, the, the global campaign for wool, um, uh, Ontario sheep farmers and Alberta lamb producers. Um, we have we have other supporters such as the Douglas Family Foundation, Holt Renfrew, and others. Um, but uh, we we are we're grateful to all of these partners for believing in and investing in the future of Canadian wool. So back over to you, Jane. And putting their money where their mouth is, <laughs> which is very important. Thanks, Matthew. Okay, next slide, please, Alyssa. All right. The story of twos. Um, we have two paths. We we narrowed everything down to two manufacturing pathways, two different types of products, and two industries or applications for Canadian wool upholstery. So we'll start with the two manufacturing pathways. As always, we look to do a Canadian pathway and we look at a foreign pathway. Why do we do this? Um, foreign pathways, and when we say foreign, we're not talking about real foreign. We're talking about our neighbors in Europe. We're talking about Great Britain. We're looking at Germany, France, Western European countries where they're used to dealing with wool that's similar to ours, um, and but they have a little bit more capacity in terms of production and a little bit more experience in production. They can offer us greater variability. Um, we do have some domestic capacity for producing upholstery. 
but it's uh, it's complicated depending on the look and the feel. Now, some Canadian manuf we do have some upholstery manufacturers in Canada that manufacture entirely in synthetic. Um, we do have a little bit of capacity to manufacture Canadian wool upholstery that comes at a real micro level. So that will be through small mills. Uh, they do a wonderful high quality finished product, but the price point is a little bit higher. So there has to be a real um, specific destination for upholstery that's coming through a smaller mill. Uh, and it has to, you know, it's going to be at a higher price point. So the application has to appeal to um, the budget of a certain um, type of buyer with discretionary spending on their products. The other option is to go with something that's a higher capacity uh, production. Um, but those, those companies have their own way of doing things. Um, they're quite married to their current pathway, which involves synthetic. So synthetic fibers, synthetic upholstery. So there is a, a mindset or a, like a mind evolution that needs to happen, as well as a bit of machinery investment to, in, to start doing wool upholstery for some of our bigger, manu our bigger upholstery manufacturers. And if I think of the conversations I've had with upholstery manufacturers around the world, it's more the mindset that has to change. It's believing in wool. And for you know the the people around this conversation, we're the the coalition of the of the willing. We're the believers. We already see the trend coming. We already see natural fiber playing an important role in the future of textile. But for the manufacturers who tend to stay quite isolated, their clients come to them. They're not necessarily going out looking for new business. What I find there is a standard answer of hmm. Don't, don't know if we need to change the way we do things. So that's what I think the biggest obstacle is for domestic production is a change in mindset. And once there's a change in mindset, uh, all, the, all the doors open to acquire the equipment necessary. Um, so until that happens, we look to our, our foreign partners, our European partners. Um, they have the capacity, but again, we have, have an issue with the complexity of upholstery. Um, Canadian wool, once it's spun, uh, we don't have the capacity to spin a lot of worsted wool, a lot of finer wool. We have a woolen capacity here. Um, it, we have capacity to create good woolen yarn for upholstery, but once that yarn is sent to European manufacturing centers, their machines might not be able to handle a thicker yarn. So there is a lot of testing that has to happen when we're producing at that commercial level of you know, rigging the can we get the yarn to the right, um, the right fineness to fit into the machinery that exists with our foreign weaving partners who have the capacity, have the know-how, and can we get that production rolling in other countries to give some hope and reason for Canadian producers to invest? And when I say producers, I don't mean sheep producers. I mean upholstery producers, manufacturers. Um, and that's always why we do the dual pathway, getting things ramped up through foreign um, service providers gives us hope and reason for us to invest in Canada. And that's where we'll start to see the mind shift happening. And I think that's where we'll start to see more investment in equipment, but we do have to make a case and it comes down to us to make that case because the manufacturers aren't going to make a case for themselves. And then the, the story of twos, the 100% wool or the blended. This is the, the most controversial piece, I think, in the presentation. Um, of course, the 100% natural is our ideal. Um, it's not appropriate for every application. Now, 100% wool, um, if it's going to be, I mean, 100% wool is, is durable. It's just all in how you are able to weave it so that it can go into a commercial setting or a residential setting, um, but the price point becomes quite high when it's 100% wool. Now, we have an opportunity with blended products, meaning we're blending 100% uh, wool fiber with a synthetic fiber. This makes the product more adaptable for different types of environment, like the transportation industry. Um, it 
lowers our price point a little bit, and it also opens up more possibility for standards. Um, when you, you know, synthetic stuff can go through all kinds of testing and get safety standards, get all sorts of accreditations. Um, natural fibers haven't gone through those tests yet. When you start to blend wool and a synthetic, um, you get a little bit more openness to doing those standards um, tests and accreditation. So I think there's an opportunity there. Um, the other point that I wanted to mention about uh, the blends is in telling the story of a blended wool product, we think, ah, oh, no, not a blend, not a synthetic blend. It's like taking 50% of the wool away and replacing it with synthetic. But you can also see it on the flip side. You can say, oh, we're taking, uh, taking a 100% synthetic upholstery and we are replacing 50% of it with wool, which improves its footprinting. Um, and it, it gets at least a portion of wool into the product and, and into the commercial space. So a blended product shouldn't be seen, I don't think, as a failure to produce a 100% wool product. It should be seen as just one more chance for wool to infiltrate the synthetics market, but benefit from the traction that synthetics already have. So we can talk a little bit more about that after, if, if that's um, something you'd like to explore. But yeah, next slide, Alyssa. Ah, the two um, applications. Well, uh, upholstery is all around us. Um, it's a, amazing when you start looking at upholstery that you start to see it everywhere. Uh, in the interior of your car, and you're sitting on a bus on a subway, you start to see that not only the seats are upholstered, but the walls are upholstered. Where, what's the best application for Canadian wool upholstery? We looked at two different industries. We narrowed it down to the residential commercial furniture sector, and we narrowed it down to the transportation industry. So I wanted to talk a little bit about both of those industries and why why they're appropriate, but what the what the difference might be in uh, in each of those industries. <clears throat> so for transportation, we looked at the business jet sector. Um, this kind of ticked a lot of boxes for me. Um, it's a manageable size of an industry. Like, and people might say, oh, it's, it seems counterintuitive, a natural product going into uh, the, the business jet or the private jet sector. But really, it's, it's, it, it built a good story, I felt. So manageable size of the industry. There are seven manufacturers of private jets in the world. That's a manageable amount of clients to target, seven. Um, with that, there's one of those manufacturers in Canada that holds 28% of market share. So if you have to convince one of these seven companies to invest in um, a collection of upholstery that's made with Canadian wool, that one manufacturer holds more than a quarter of the global industry. So already we've got a great funnel um, going in with our, our Canadian manufacturer, who it's no secret, it's Bombardier. Um, with completion centers in Montreal, Toronto, and Winnipeg, I believe. Um, the other thing about the business jet sector is that it's quite consistent. On average, there are 730 business jets entering the, the global aviation portfolio, the global inventory. That doesn't include jet refurb refurbishment. But just 750, between 730 and 750 new jets entering the airspace every year with an average of between nine and 19 seats. And we can estimate that one seat will take a maximum of about two meters of upholstery. So that creates like a real finite uh, amount of upholstery that, that you would need to service um, a, private, a private jet industry. That seemed to match up nicely with the available wool, the quantity and quality that we need. That seemed to be a good match. We're not reaching for the stars. We're reaching for a real attainable goal. Um, and the jet industry also, over the last couple of years, has put out a lot of reports on how they want to improve their carbon footprint. Already, they got a, a, a battle to face because, you know, they're, they're known to be one of the more polluting transportation uh, modalities. But in terms of how they're 
um, designing their interiors. They're designing them to be more green. They're looking for green products inside. And the same thing is being seen over in jet refurbishment, where you can take a 20-year-old aircraft and have it be um, uh, redesigned inside um, and, and, and possibly bring their, their green score up a little bit. I think there are some people that are probably going to start to object to those those terms like carbon footprinting and 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 green scoring, but we still use them for now just to represent the intention of of improving the sustainability of the products. Um, and uh, there was another point I wanted to make. Oh, with that, yeah. The other thing with with jets too is you have. Um, kind of a finite number or finite amount of uh, variables for the upholstery. It's not sky's, mm, sky's the limit. Sorry for the bad joke. But it's not sky's the limit. You have a certain amount of weight that the entire interior of the cabin can weigh. Um, you have certain um, materials that can or can't go into the aircraft. So that already narrows down what the offer could look like. Um, from a production standpoint, that really helps a manufacturer to say, hey, I know I need this amount of wool. It's got to be this micron. It's got to be produced this way. It's got to have this finish on it. It's got to be delivered this way. And that, uh, surprisingly, in the textile industry really helps when you have fewer possibilities rather than more. And if you can believe, um, what was it? Last week, I think Alyssa Volvo came out with their announcement that thanks to a um, a collaboration with Woolmark, they have started putting a wool blend upholstery in their high-end SUV, their, their highest uh, model of SUV. Um, and the reviewers of this latest Volvo talked about the comfort of being in a car that is upholstered with a wool blend upholstery and that they favored it over um, the, the typical perforated leather upholstery. It made it more comfortable, cozier. So that, that's a good omen. So thank you, Volvo, for taking the leap. And I guess thank you, Walmart, for all their incredible work because they've really been able to um, push manufacturers to include wool. So that's what made the transportation industry kind of a, a, an appealing option for upholstery. And then we looked at the residential and commercial application. Um, there's lots of variabilities with furniture, uh, office, like commercial space furniture and residential furniture. It's really as big as your imagination. Um, Canada is one of the world's largest furniture exporters. Um, we are also known for our high-end furniture. So the price point of our furniture that's leaving Canada uh, aligns nicely with the Canadian upholstery. Our closest um, export partner is the US and after that it's Qatar. So we're seeing a lot of the furniture manufacturing in Canada crossing over the border or it's going more toward the Middle East. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting possibility for wool too, um, to see our, our wool get into the US space. Next slide, please. The export story. Why do we focus on export in these plants? Um, well, export is important for a lot of reasons. It's the key to the sustainability of the Canadian economy. Um, we can't just produce uh, products to sell to Canadians. That's not really a good strategy for us. So our government focuses on creating Canadian products to go to other countries. And hence, when they were, when the opportunity for our funding came along uh, to look at Canadian wool products, we had to have that export um, objective in mind. Um, so, you know, we've, we've heard that from people before. Why aren't you, you know, creating products to sell within Canada? Well, we are. We're doing that dual pathway again. We want to sell domestically, but we do have to keep an emphasis on export. Um, we have a, a direct export win when it comes to transportation because uh, a refurbishment center or a completion center for uh, uh, whether it's a, a business jet whether it's an automobile, a boat, typically that company is gonna buy bolts of upholstery. And this is where Canada can be competitive and we can see our upholstery on bolts leaving Canada as upholstery. 
Um, for that, to me, I saw as a direct export win. We are ticking that box for, for our Canadian economy. We have an indirect win with furniture. It's the furniture companies that would most likely be buying our upholstery to put on their furniture that would then be exported. So Canadian upholstery is not necessarily getting the win for the upholstery leaving Canada on a bolt, uh, but it is also hitting an international market through our Canadian furniture manufacturers buying the upholstery. Um, so I thought that was interesting to point out those two. I still see it as a win for export both ways. It's just that the furniture companies will be getting the credit when you start to look at Statistics Canada over the next five years. Um, we won't see as much upholstery leaving Canada under uh, an export model. It'll be more under the furniture that exports. Next slide. There we go. Okay, so some of the some of the things that emerged from uh, from this study. Um, there was a 1991 Industry Canada um, review of the textile industry, and they reviewed the popularity of synthetics and the amazing possibilities with synthetics. And a little blurb down at the bottom that said, um, there is virtually no domestic wool available for textile. And I thought, wow, isn't that strange? Because in the years leading up to 1991, so if we look at like 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, um, Canada had the highest sheep population. And that's also around the same time that the uh, Rideau breeds of sheep, which were a domestically created breed, um, by Agriculture Canada, um, created for meat, milk, and wool. So the breed was meant to produce wool. Um, in the, Agriculture Canada had a specific mandate for that breed, and we also saw really high sheep populations. So why on earth would this come out in a federal government report that um, there's no wool available domestically? I don't know whether any of you find that too fascinating, but I kind of think of it almost like a murder mystery. I just think this is where a chasm started to build between innovation and agriculture. Um, and that chasm only grew. I think that perhaps our federal government looking toward what's easy to export, where can we get export wins? We have uh, a growing and thriving uh, synthetic fiber industry. We have DuPont, we have other manufacturers who are producing with, with plastics, synthetics. Um, this is a great opportunity for the economy. Let's start pushing in that direction. And let's like push the natural fiber out of the scene a little bit. But in parallel, our agriculture industry was, was seemingly doing very well in 91. And it was it was moving into having its own breed, to producing more sheep, to doing something with the wool. Um, and so I just thought that was a, a fascinating, um, you know, point where we started to see the communication getting wider and wider apart and less effective. And I think this is where, um, you know, if we had have had a wool plan in 1991 to say, whoa, whoa, wait up, we've got wool. Who's, who's saying that we don't have wool? We have wool. And to create, if we had have created a, a strong marketing program then for Canadian wool, we probably wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. Um, but everything, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens with the right timing. So we get to have our, our renaissance of wool now. But I just thought that was an interesting thing that came out of the research this time. Um, the variability in upholstery was, um, I think, one of the most challenging aspects of doing the upholstery plan without having done the prototype first. Like I said before, the the upholstery is as the variability is as wide as your imagination. We know that you can have a, a woven upholstery, we can have a felted upholstery, or we can have a tufted upholstery. Um, to think about tufting, you almost think about a velour, right? 
that's something that you might see it on the like the upholstery and seats on buses. Um, for those of you in big centers where you have a subway, uh, you know that the subways are covered with the um, like a, a, a pile type of upholstery. Um, so already three different types of upholstery. That's different than the carpets. The carpet we kind of have woven or tufted. It's one or the other. And the carpet yarn is quite quite standard. It's you need this thickness of yarn. It's pretty straightforward. Upholstery, you can start to get a jacquard weave going, which a lot adds a lot of variability. Um, you can play with different thicknesses of yarn. You can get into different breeds. Of course, merino takes up a lot of space in every in every type of textile. That creates a finer type of upholstery. Um, and so I would say um, when you're looking at the financial model that's included with the upholstery plan, I still stand by it. It's it's very credible, but it's still quite a loose estimate. And you can only get final numbers once you pinpoint exactly what type of upholstery you want to make and where it's going to go. Uh, you have to have rub tests done. You have to see how it's going to stand up for the environment it's it's going to be in. If it's going to be a you know, um, a Chesterfield, um, it might, might not need to have the same durability if it's on an airplane seat. Uh, that will, and what types of coatings you're going to need on the upholstery. With carpet, we can say we're leaving it natural, wool is very durable. Yes, perfectly feasible. With upholstery, you might need to consider um, some type of, of protection on it, some type of coating on it, depending on where it's going, depending on what the, the end user or the client wants. So, so I would say that was uh, something, you know, the variability is something that was quite different from any other project that we've done. And um, the numbers, the costs, uh, they are going to be greatly affected by what you'd like to do with the upholstery. Next slide, Alyssa. All right, so I'm gonna hand this one over to Matt because I think he's sort of unveiling um, our next prototyping opportunity. Um, so Matthew, I'll let you talk about the, um, the upholstery prototype. And then after that, we'll open it up to questions and we can circle back to any aspect of what I've talked about today or if you have other questions, if you've already had a chance to read the plan, then you can ask questions that weren't in the presentation today. Matthew. Yeah, thank you, Jane, uh, and, and thank you for your excellent presentation. Um, this is this is a bit preliminary, but this because it's still in the proposal stage, so this still has to go. It still has to be approved by their respective boards. Um, but there's great excitement and interest from both organizations uh, to be able to kind of uh, to implement Jane's plan uh, into prototype form. And so the idea around this is to create a Canadian Chesterfield or an Ontario Chesterfield uh, and a, a and an Alberta armchair um, made completely out of, of wool from those respective provinces uh, and looking to have both production, uh, all, all domestic Canadian production um, for, for every step of the process uh, and to have those, those products um, completed and ready to show off at the uh, conference in Montreal uh, in December. So uh, again, this is a kind of an asterisk of pending approval, um, but we hope at least one of these will move forward um, because I think again, just like with the rugs, once you once you see what Canadian wool is capable of in in form, it's one thing to read it uh, in a in a well researched report, um, but uh, but but to actually see the physical item, see how beautiful uh, you know a design can be rendered, uh, and and see how that performs and stacks up against other forms of upholstery, I think is a whole other matter, and and really. Uh, again, is is the chance to create a new product line and then a new pipeline uh, for use of or for for Canadian wool um, to uh, have value added right here at home. So we will certainly be keeping you all in the loop as those proposals move forward. Um, but we are very hopeful that we'll get at least one of those into production uh, by the end of this year. And of course, once that initial hurdle is 
is uh, cleared. I invite all of you to take a discerning eye to the uh, your couches, armchairs, uh, anything you can upholster. Even if it's not upholstered right now, think about how much beautiful it would more more lovely it would look covered in 100% Canadian wool. Um, so uh, because inevitably that's where we're taking this is to be a, a an ongoing commercial endeavor. So uh, so yeah, start start thinking about how you're going to redo your house with 100% Canadian upholstery. And as Jane mentioned, don't even don't limit yourself just to couches and chairs. And of course, we can do rugs as well. Uh, think about wall panels. Uh, you know, we could you could have an entire upholstered room. Uh, think how cozy that would be. So um, just start those hamster wheels turning, uh, and uh, we'll cir circle back once we have price points and order forms. Uh, so back over to you, Jane. <laughs> yeah, price points and order forms. That's going to be a couple of years yet, but I think it's moving in that direction. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Um, if we could take the, the presentation down, please. Uh, see, it's so much easier when I see like all your names. I don't feel like I'm talking into the void. Uh, with the with the PowerPoint on the screen, but anyway, question already. What do you got, Barbara? Okay, so who's you're saying you're going to do like a Chesterfield, um, other one Davenport, whatever the name is. Anyway, who's making the furniture? I mean, who's building the base? I can't hear you, Matthew. You're you're muted. Yes, yeah. very 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 good question. So so we're talking to a couple potential suppliers. So there's quite a few different manufacturers that manufacture furniture in Canada. So um, we're we're in talks with with a couple different ones. So we haven't we haven't nailed down uh, a supplier yet. But I have, uh, a, I have a suggestion. Sure. There are a lot of woodworking cabinetry, um, usually community colleges. Um, think tech schools and things like that, where they have to do various projects and all, it would be a really interesting thing, call out to those different ones and say, we would provide a length of upholstery fabric to you if your students would get involved in a challenge to build furniture that used it. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm just, I mean, I know you're going to go to some formalized furniture people, but yes. if you can get in at people that are just coming into the vocation yes, and get them involved in it, you know, they're going to have, they have to build things. Usually they have to do a special project anyway in their mm -hmm. classes. But if you set, put some kind of guidelines around it and just say, we want you to do something that's going to be upholstered and we're going to provide the fabric. So that takes the cost out of them okay because they're going to have to cover the cost of their wood and stuff like that but the fabric and then you do an actual competition across country yeah oh, I, li I really like that idea and in fact i think that could almost be like a phase two in terms of mm -hmm. once once we have the system set up to create the fabric of uh, that that's that's a way of rolling it out after the initial prototype uh and, and being able to reach a much wider a wider area I, I i really like that idea and i think that that's mm -hmm. something that could be appealing to uh, particular donors as well in order to um to spread it around so yeah so we'll start we'll start looking at that for sure yeah and would you please move away from just merino honestly oh no no this would be <laughs> this would be 100 percent. this would be canadian wool and so we don't have any merino <laughs> like, so so this is all uh, just like with the rugs this okay. is using the wool that we grow right now in canada this okay. isn't um unlike when you know we have items that are being produced using merino like like sometimes some of our fashion collections will have canadian items but then we'll also because the designers want to use merino mm -hmm. um then we have that as well but with these two plans both mm -hmm. the carpet plan and the upholstery plan it's all about using 100% canadian wool of what we're producing right now so yes they okay. would be it would be completely using existing canadian supplies of wool to make this okay all right thank you that's probably my fault too, because I did mention Merino as being kind of the the Pac-Man that chews up all the wool opportunities in the world. And I think it's Volvo, the Volvo um, interior upholstery is a Merino synthetic blend. Mm -hmm. So then that's why I mentioned Merino, but no, we don't, um, we don't have Merino too much in, in Canada. We have other 
nice wolves, but this would be with our our downs, mostly our downs breeds of of uh, mm -hmm. wolf. Okay. Somebody had asked a question. I noticed Alyssa. It was Janet on. Uh, yeah, Janet. It's you're absolutely right. Wool can be a great replacement when you're doing the stuffing in a in a, a sofa or you know a chair. Um, but we did not investigate what it would look like to manufacture that type of, of stuffing. We looked only at uh, woven, felted, or pile tufted fabric. And if you do have a question, you can either raise your hand or just throw it in the chat and one of us will read it. Um, there was a comment from Nancy. Nancy, did you just want to? speak to that yep sorry you were asking me nancy nancy is nancy here yes okay. she might have stepped away from her computer though okay um well it was just about um she was on parliament hill and she was asking about renovations and because they're ongoing 15 to 20 years um they're um, pointed out that all construction materials to date are used from Canada and that they would pass along if to us if there are any renovations that can be done in wool. And Mary said that she does have a Chesterfield made from wool felt from EQ3, but she doesn't think that it is Canadian. It's not, it Mary. I have the it same. It wouldn't couch. be. <laughs> it's, it's Italian. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> it's Italian wool. Okay. Yeah, I, I have the same one and I, and I specifically ordered the wool upholstery on it. Um, and that technique is a woven and felted combined. So the backing I'm told is woven and then they, they felt on top of the woven fabric. Right. Yeah. It's a very it, nice finish. It is. Yeah. And if they had the wool, then it would be a hundred percent made in Canada. Yeah, well, EQ3 is has been on our radar for a while. And, you know, we've, I've reached out to them when I was researching. Um, I think I, we started reaching out to them, Matthew, when we did the carpet plan. Yes. Uh, and yeah. they've got a really, they have a really interesting story too, given that I believe the, the founders who are a husband and wife team, um, the, the, their parents are the owners of Palliser Furniture, which is Canada's largest furniture manufacturer. So a great great legacy there but eq3 is looking to do a lot of sustainable mid to high end stuff so yeah. yeah and i mean that's one of the reasons why we chose upholstery to begin with as being one of the products we'd be looking at is because canada still has this hub of furniture manufacturing there's smaller scale manufacturing all across the country but but uh, at the larger scale particularly in winnipeg is a hub of of furniture manufacturing and export and so uh, driven by companies like eq3 and palliser um and so we thought again that that could be a, a great opportunity for a canadian upholstery product to be used by one of these canadian manufacturers as a premium product um if i could speak to nancy's point um that is a great point and actually Every successful, you know, one of the, the common threads, um, pardon the pun, of every successful wool strategy uh, and every successful domestic wool strategy is the underpinning is government procurement. And whether that's procurement in terms of uniforms uh, for the military, for example, that's one of the driving pieces of the U.S. wool industry is the fact that they, they have the exclusive contract to supply all of of the um, the wool in American u military uniforms comes from American sheep farms. Um, so again, taking this again, the, the the largest landowner in this country is the federal government, and they own a lot of buildings, a lot of offices, and particularly, um, you know, Nancy, to your point on. Uh, Parliament again. These are these are high end um, finishes. They use natural materials, um, and up until very recently, we haven't had the ability to make uh, items of the quality that they would demand. But we do now. So one of the ironies is that one of our partners uh, in creating Canadian wool rugs 
Creative Matters, they actually did the rug in the Senate, uh, in, in the temporary Senate, which is in the old um, train station uh, in Ottawa. And so you'll see it when they do the speech from the throne. It's a red carpet with little maple leaves on it. But that's actually made with New Zealand wool because we didn't have our partnership in place before they created that. So this is a good opportunity to go back to them and say, well, now we can make we can make whatever, whether it's upholstery or rugs, um, to to finish out these interiors, uh, and we can make them with 100% Canadian wool. And so, um, yeah, that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, a great suggestion, and we would love to um, to be put in touch uh, with with Public Works and uh, your, your senator contact as well uh, to be able to uh, to drive this forward because that is the the long term base of a Canadian wool industry is 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 one that is supported by government procurement. And we just have a question from Liz. Is there a standard width for woven upholstery fabrics? Is wider better? No, the standard is always around 54 inches. Okay, pretty succinct <laughs> answer. Um, Gagan is asking, do we have a carbonizing plant for getting the wool free from vegetable matter? I know a company, they import wool in Canada from Argentina for filling quilts and pillows. We have no carbonizing facilities in Canada. And Mary is saying, and the cushions are stuffed with a combo of foam and down. Maybe it could be fam and wool stuffing. I'm not sure what she wants. Foam and wool stuffing. Foam, sorry. Foam, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. And, and you know, again, for uh, importing wool, I mean, wool that for, for stuffing, for duvets, that kind of thing, um, it's the finding the equipment or the, the people to, to make that that would be great. Because for a stuffing, it doesn't make sense economically to export our wool to have it turned into material for stuffing. It's just that the transport costs are just too high for something that is not going to be a lot of value added for the for the piece itself. It would be better to make it all natural to import wool that's already from another country that's already in that form. Unless there's a, com a company here that is, you know, carding wool to be batting, to be that kind of foam stuffing or the wool stuffing and nancy is wondering if our government uses wool in their military uniforms no unfortunately not canadian wool they do use wool oh. uh, but it's but they use but it's it's usually it's italian spun um we we do work with a manufacturer who makes the sweaters for example for the the military they're based here in toronto um but all their the the yarn they use is all 100% merino spun in Italy. Um, so this is something we've been talking to them for a little while about how to uh, go about, because again, in order to meet the specifications that they have to fulfill, it would have to be a finer wool. It's not that that doesn't exist in Canada, but it's, it's a little more difficult pulling together that level of fineness and getting it processed in the right way. Uh, but uh, but we see that as an opportunity for sure. Um, all all Canadian uh, military uniforms are made of wool, like in the traditional way, like, uh, you know, the jackets and the pants, it's all wool. It's just, again, up until very, you know, now, <laughs> uh, none of that has been Canadian. Uh, and that's a separate, again, when you're talking about clothing, uh, you know, again, we're, we're, you're, you're dealing with finer micron and you're dealing with, um, uh, you know, specialized sheep breeds like Rambouillet to be, and, and the, a lot of what we currently produce, you probably, we probably have to work on the genetics for a couple of years to get it to where it would need to be to meet those needs again this is something that we're that we're looking at but no it's currently the, all the wool that they use comes from someplace else and sasha is asking if ttc or transit upholstery could be an option per, to pursue with a push for electric buses wouldn't they be interested in wool upholstery if not for all seats perhaps just for the captain chairs to start yeah i think that's a great idea although the the price point on a wool upholstery, where we keep in mind this idea of premium pricing for the farmer, 
um, that's, it's going to be tough, I think, to get Canadian wool into this volume, like a, a public transit volume of upholstery. Just knowing the numbers, I think that that, this is why the private jet industry was better in, in my mind, because here there's a big volume that you'll need. Um, I mean, I guess TTC, it's still a, it's still a, not an enormous volume, but it's just that if we're giving fair pricing to the farmer, that's a little bit harder to justify, I think, in those, in those, um, in that application. I don't know, Matthew, I can all already tell by the look on your face, you disagree. Well, no, no, I was going to say that, yes, maybe off the, off the, but when you think about like the amount of money wasted on transit in delays of construction, like one one month's delay on like Eglinton would pay for all the wool and many and many times more. Uh, so uh, like, I think again, it's it's, yes, it would be a premium thing, but it's also something that would be lasting a long time. And this is there, you know, you only have to look over the pond to see, you know, when you go on the new Elizabeth line uh, on the the crossrail uh, in the UK, those that's all wool, or it, it, I think there is a bit of synthetic blend in there, but it's that that was done with wool. So it is, it's doable. And there's other transit systems that have done it. So I like, I like the idea because, and again, this, this links to the idea of of government procurement overall, if you can produce these kinds of uh, quality of textile um, and uh, and supply it to agencies like TTC, like Metrolinx, the Go Trains, um, again, it, it, it's it's long lasting and uh, and it creates a more a more comfortable ride. Even if we can do it as a one off, um, having just come back from Japan and seeing um, some of of the the train interiors there, and even some of the specialty ones like like the Pikachu train uh, or the Pokemon train, uh, which has it's all like carpeted and like wool carpet and like has these special uh upholstery upholstery and things like that maybe we could do that as a special even as a, a one-off at, at the beginning a special like via rail car or a special uh toronto transit car and and then once people feel the difference they'll be just demanding demanding wool and when you're talking about infrastructure spending i know again it's often the lower price of rules today, but again, the, the the money you're spending on something like tunneling, or like building um, building cars is just massive. So like the cost of the fabric is just is almost like a rounding error at that point. So maybe we can benefit from that. But uh, yeah. Well, we'll send you in to do the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> And then along the lines of Bombardi, like imagine the Trans Canada via, you know, in the luxury cars, like that could be right. really cool. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I anyone who's had to sit in leather upholstery for any length of time knows that it is not the better option. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much. Well, and I don't, I don't want to be the, what do we call it, Matthew, the, the Debbie the Downer. Debbie Downer? I don't want to be the Debbie Downer, <laughs> but I do want to say that it's been a long time since we've had wool that's been tested for that high demand environment. Um, so there's that whole range of testing that would have to be done. It has to meet standards. This is where the blend comes in. Uh, is the and and for the price point, it does it does matter because when they have to budget for tunneling and all these other things, they're going to cut where they can cut. And if they can shave off seventy five percent of the cost by having a synthetic. It's a hard case to make for the public, for just general public use, that it be wool. Again, that's the mind shift that needs to happen in Canada more than anything else. But our plans here always look for the easy win, like the or the the shortest route. So anyway, it's it's a healthy, it's a healthy debate to have, but I kind of wanted to play devil's advocate on that because these stuff like that, changing people's mindsets, they're not easy wins. We know that. So we can just tell them it won't smell as much, which should get everyone on board. <laughs> um, Mary Richardson is asking, what about higher end hotels and inns? Seems like a good market for ecologically produced carpets and upholstery. Um, I think Creative Matters Inc. is already doing some of that. But Jane, can you speak to that? I agree. I, and, and again, I think those are places that are easy wins because hotels, they need to have you know, well-appointed rooms where you can have more wool content, then you can have a less well-appointed room where you have wool accessories. And all of that has a price point that's 
that can be justified because you know when you look at the the cost of the hotels they're not necessarily looking to do it the most economical they're looking for to create an experience so i think those are great opportunities and and yeah creative matters already does a lot of ballrooms and and cruise ships and things like that i think canadian upholstery for the level that we're working at right now what about you know yachts probably like you know higher end boats things like that for what do they call it? like leisure craft boats personal watercraft there's an opportunity there too not personal watercraft because it's like a jet ski can't have wool on a jet ski but <laughs> you know what i mean it would get very soggy <laughs> on the fly on the fly deck of your mega yacht you can put the wool upholstery on the benches up there exactly uh, Gagon is saying that they um they supplied the military with blankets with Canadian wool um in 2015. So they do use some um, Canadian wool. Um and he posted the link to that. Um and he asked about hospitals and using wool blankets for that. Uh there's an obstacle with the Canadian with health. Canada like with Canadian provincial health uh to get wool products into hospital settings there's our wool is not perceived to be washable enough and it's not perceived to be microbial 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 enough to pass antimicrobial antimicrobial <laughs> thank you to pass that uh pass those tests uh, it would have to be, you would have to have a product and then you would have to pitch it to your regional health network and go through the steps. But I understand once your product gets approved, you're home free. Um, you will always have a, a client that's willing to purchase from you, but it is a real um, upward climb to get hospitals to approve natural fibers. I'm just going to read out the last comment from Amy and then if they're at last call for questions or comments, um, just put your hand up or throw them in the comments, in the chat. So Amy's saying, I'm an entrepreneur of wool duvets and wool fill pillows. I use wool from three different flocks that I hand pick and use custom woolen mills in Alberta to wash and card the wool for me. So there's a mill in Canada that does make beautiful large wool bats. I'm excited for where the campaign for wool is going to lead Canadian wool. Thank you for your work. Um, great comment. Any more questions, comments, last call? Going once, going twice? No? Okay. We can wrap it up. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, and thank you, Jane, for such an uh, enlightening decision and for all your hard work really crunching the numbers. This uh, this kind of research does not come easy. Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, uh, and the, the numbers are often not just sitting there to be discovered. It's, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that goes to putting that together. So round of applause uh, for you for, for this latest uh, in, in your research efforts. And we look forward to the next endeavor. Um, and speaking of which, we, uh, we don't have our next speaker confirmed yet, but we will be sending out a notification very soon so please stay tuned for our july speaking event um and and as always we appreciate your your thoughts and comments uh on who you would like to see and the sorts of topics that you would like to have discussed so thank you again for for all your support and most importantly for continuing to choose wool in everything that you do so have have a great day and enjoy uh, enjoy the sunshine <laughs>